Tell me what, why you're here today and what you hope to achieve. Well, in the first place, I hope to get to my medicine so my leg will go on hurting the way it's been since I cut off my side. That is the most important, immediate, existential fact. I am in pain. I want medicine. The second reason I'm here is I happen to believe in states' rights. I believe in the Tenth Amendment, which most people have never heard of. If you look in the back of your dictionary, you find a document called the U.S. Constitution. It has nothing to do with the way this government is operating under George Bush, which is the way it's supposed to operate. And the Tenth Amendment says all power is not delegated to the federal government, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Now, the state of California and the people of California are behind me. The federal government has no right to, to, no right to condemn me to a life of constant pain, is what they're trying to do. I don't know what kind of sadistic son of a bitch George Bush is, why he wants to leave people in pain like this. I, I don't approve of it, I don't like it, and I'm ready, to, I'm ready to fight for my right to be free of pain. If you're going to be in pain most of the day, you're not going to enjoy your life much. And George Bush insists that God has appointed him to, to ensure that I spend the rest of my life in pain without any relief. And I say, fuck you, George Bush, you should have these pains in your goddamn life. I know it doesn't sound very, but I'm a Buddhist most of the time, but today I'm too angry to be a Buddhist. I'll get back to being a Buddhist tomorrow. Anything else you want to add? Any final thoughts today? Yeah. I'm sorry for my bitterness against you, George Bush. He is equally empty, equally blessed, and equally a coming Buddhist. The trouble with the asshole doesn't know it. Okay. I'd like to introduce Robert Anton Wilson, um, 72, who has post polio syndrome. I can speak. I am indeed Robert Anton Wilson, and I do indeed have post polio syndrome. But I am not 72, I am only 70. <laughs> and I will go get my medicine after saying I like that sign. I will pick up my medicine after saying I like it. Of all the signs out there, the one I like best is the one telling the government to read the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment says that all power is not delegated to the gov federal government or reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Nowhere does it say that a goddamn czar will be in charge of my medical care and interfere between me and my doctor. Anybody in Philadelphia in the 18th century suggested putting something like that in the Constitution would have been considered a raving lunatic. This Constitution was not created to establish a czarist tyranny, it was established to create a free society. I, I think my writing comes out of anger and optimism. Anger at the stupid, maniacal, or corrupt crowd that's running the world at present, and optimistic about the opportunities that are so real. This, as I say, is the result of uh, my outrage, my horror, my grief, and my anger at the, the way the world has been going lately, and my continued optimism that maybe enough people can wake up on time to change the direction we're going in. So I got both optimism and anger, which I think is a good mixture. It keeps me busy anyway. I have a lot of hope. I thought I may be the last optimist left on the planet for all I know. But at the same time, I see really terrible problems and injustices and violence all over the place. I just think we're, we're heading for a point at which that will no longer be viable. Somehow we're going to have to find a more decent form of society if we're going to survive at all. <clears throat> you can only write about what has impinged upon your nervous system strongly enough to leave a powerful imprint. And I, when I was 12 years old, they opened the Nazi annihilation camps. I think that's a very vulnerable age for imprints. I grew up feeling I, live, I was living in a race of monsters. And I've lived all through the Cold War, the Vietnam War, 
and a lot of other tragedies, personal and otherwise. And uh, I can't, I can't write fiction without violence in it because violence is so much part of the world I've lived in. It's obvious they're getting, they're getting closer and closer to the edge where they can cure anything. Meanwhile, the world is moving closer and closer to the edge where they can kill us all. <laughs> it's very interesting. Science is going in one direction and the politics is going in the other. I'm still an optimist. I think I, I think eventually people give up doing stupid things. It's like walking into a wall over and over. Eventually you start looking through the door and you do something intelligent. <laughs> the human race has to do something intelligent in the next 10 or 20 years and it just can't go on screwing up everything. We're living among infinite possibilities and the prevalent philosophies of postmodernist pessimism that come out of the universities are really a major tragedy. The opportunities for progress and change of a positive nature are absolutely tremendous. And anybody who tells you that we're running out of resources, we're in a terrible mess, they're idiots. We can't run out of resources. Resources exist when the human mind sees how to use something. To say we're running out of resources is like saying we're running out of brain cells. I don't know why so many people spend so much time in a pessimistic reality tunnel. It's a miserable place to live. Mm -hmm. But some people feel if they leave it, they feel guilty. You're supposed, if you're not in a pessimistic tunnel, you're not responsible. Uh, but once I get out of it, I never wanted to go back into it again. As far as I know, I'm the only survivor of the 60s who was just as angry and just as optimistic as I was then. Besides, until I die, I might as well be optimistic. Every day you've got choices to make, and the more optimistic you feel, the more likely you are to make uh, charitable and kindly choices rather than angry and bitter ones. If you want to be the most depressed person in the world, get up every morning and remind yourself George Bush is still in the White House. <laughs> and then listen to CNN for a while, where you'll find out that American bombers are pounding another part of Afghanistan. But if you think about George Bush and other gloomy things every day, eventually you get pessimistic enough that eventually you'll take an overdose of the sedatives your doctor gave you to control your depression. Then you'll be out of it. I mean, we'll do it every day. I want to become a concert pianist, do it every day. I want to be a writer, do it every day. I want to become depressed, think of depressing thoughts every day. I want to become an optimist, think of cheerful thoughts every day. Do it every day. I think over the course of my life, I have evolved from a basically rational person to a basically intuitive person without completely losing my reason, I hope. And intuitive people do tend to live in the future. Intuitive people do tend to live in the future. I don't believe in golden ages, I don't believe in the past. But I think a golden age is possible in the future, and why not try for it? I, very, I, have, I have very... I think, I think Bernard Shaw calls it the life force. I got this, I got this tremendous drive to try to do what I can to add my contribution to making a much better future than the history of humanity has been up until the present. And I think the joy of art is trying to convey what you perceive so that other people will perceive it more or less the same way. Art is a form of seduction. I mean, there are rapists in the intellectual world. They become politicians. The seducers become artists. We try to seduce people into our reality tunnels of leading them.